lot when we were do when we were doing various elements of um, filtering in the UA interface. Didn't exist uh, in GA4 for the early parts, but again, that was reintroduced. Conversions used to just be controlled either once per session, but you can now change that to fire once per event or once per session. That's quite a big change, but it happened very late in the day. And probably my favorite one is the landing page report, which we as marketers probably use quite a lot in universal analytics, but it didn't exist in GA4 until again, marketers came along, built it from scratch, and Google ended up building it into the interface. It's a quirky report for GA4 though. Uh, we'll cover that when we, we get to it. So if you are worried about GA4 and not feeling like it's you're, you're fully up to speed on it, I wouldn't worry too much. Google seems to be a little bit panicky and is still pushing updates, change requests, features all the time. Uh, there are also some instances where it just stops working and has to be reloaded from scratch. So Universal Analytics dates back to 2012-ish. You could argue it was probably earlier than that, if you consider Urchin on which the, um, the code base was built. Cookies are required. It was a data model based on sessions. You could deploy it through Tag Manager or natively. You had multiple views, one of the big things missing in GA4. You can store user data for up to 50 months, and it had many, many standard built-in reports, possibly too many, and it can process events within four hours. GA4, on the other hand, dates back to 2019 when it entered beta as web, web and app view. Uh, cookies are not required. The entire data model is based on events. And again, it can be deployed through Tag Manager or natively within the code. So it's singular view. You have no more test view available. You can create a test GA4 account uh, if you wish to, but you'll have two accounts rather than two views. You can store user data for up to 14 months. And it's got very few built-in reports. Um, reason I mentioned that is You'll notice in the interface that Google is trying to push you to use Looker Studio, uh, previously known as the name's gone from my head now, but Looker Studio is the current name for it. Um, it was another purchase by Google, but that's designed to process a lot of your data in one central reporting interface. So you can build dashboards and reports in there very easily. The whole purpose with GA4 is to take your data, push it into Looker, and build it out again. A couple of things to note with GA4 though is it can take up to 72 hours to process events fully. And given that the entire data model is based on events, if you look in the reporting interface, you won't be able to see events being tracked on the day you're currently on. So it can take 24 hours, but it can also take up to 72 hours. If you end up looking back on your reporting, you may find that some of the numbers are different if you look a day or two later. So it might sound quite different, and the long and short of it is, it is different. Uh, there's no escaping it, but there's also no escaping the change if you still want to use Google Analytics as your reporting and data analytics platform. It's better to understand it as much as you can, embrace the change and communicate the newer metrics and the dimensions that you have available further up the business. So whether you're looking at measuring acquisition, engagement or monetization, e-commerce, there are some things that you need to know that you need to help communicate back through your various businesses. I can also understand and appreciate the anxiety around an entirely new reporting solution uh, and data analytics platform, but hopefully the overview and tool we provide today will help. But one of the, probably the best tip I can give you is to experiment with someone else's Google Analytics 4 account. So if you haven't used GA4 quite yet, don't worry. Um, as I say, you've still got your universal analytics data there for another two weeks. It's not going to be deleted. Uh, you can still pull your data from there. But GA4 will be the only analytics platform from Google that processes new data from the 1st of July. Now, in the next two weeks, what I'd probably recommend you do is experiment with Google Analytics's demo account itself. So you can access that just by searching for Google Analytics for demo account. You'll find it pretty quickly. It's on Google's support pages, but that will allow you to get a little bit more familiar with the interface, navigating your way around. And if you make changes in there, it's not going to impact any of your data. And um, you also can't 
permanently uh, affects the Google Analytics for demo account data. But you can apply filters, comparisons, and get more comfortable using it without fear of impacting your own. OK, so we are going to get to know the Google Analytics 4 interface. And we're going to start with navigation. There are two types of navigation in the interface for GA4. Not all levels and reports will be relevant for you. And the GA4 is built for web and app analytics. So if you don't have an app or an app data stream, you won't see data populating in some of these reports. There's a couple of um, metric names that also won't necessarily make sense. Uh, but we'll come across those when we go through the, the interface as well. And I'll mention those there. So level one navigation is on the left-hand side there. You'll see where it says home, reports, explore, and advertising. Now home is going to be a dashboard view, and it will display you a series of interactive cards. Reports is going to be the built-in reports available to you that Google has provided. Explore is the new exploration tool. It's pretty cool. It's pretty powerful. Um, it'll allow you to combine multiple metrics, dimensions, segments, you can build audiences from the segments if you want to use them for Google Ads bidding and targeting. And then you have an advertising report as well, which is attribution and channel performance measurement. There's also access to the settings from the bottom left with a cog icon there. So that's level one of the navigation. Level two is only available on the reports or advertising sections. So if you click on either of those, a new menu will slide out from the left and it'll provide you to access to the report contained within. You can customize this navigation for yourselves. Um, so if you build your own reports within GA4 interface, you can save them into groupings and these will be available for you there. You can also collapse the menu at any time as well because it, it does take up quite a bit of the screen. So if you look down in the bottom corner, You've got the arrow, which will allow you to slide that uh, back across to the left, and then you can slide it back out again if you wish to. Two types of navigation, top level, level one, and level two, which is only available on reports and advertising. So before we go into the reports, one of the, the biggest changes and upgrades is the search functionality. We're going to take a quick look at that. It's powered by Google's AI. Uh, one of the Great things with this is you can ask it questions in natural language and it'll try and provide you with the answers within the search itself rather than sending you through to a report for you to then find the, the results yourself. We'll also cover site search in this section. Uh, site search has had a migration from UA. It's also been enhanced, but there is a, a warning and things to consider when, when employing it. So as I mentioned there, uh, search has gotten smart in the interface. It's contain, contained in the top right, uh, the top area here. So where you've got your account access, you'll see your search. But if you start typing questions into the here, you'll be presented with the answers in the, the drop-down results, and it'll allow you to copy directly from the results without having to go through to a report. So if you're being asked for how many new users did you attract in the last 30 days, you could type that question into the search bar, and if Google's AI can work out the answer for you, it'll present it there, it'll allow you to copy the information and you can just paste it into an email or into any results you're pulling. It's pretty cool. It's relatively new. I know copy functionality seemed like a very minor thing, but as the quality of life improvement change goes, it's, it's pretty handy. So here we've used how many returning users were yesterday, how many new users this year, and then how much revenue per product in January. So that there's a lot you can do with this. It's um, very handy. Experiment with it um, and have a play around. Site search on the other hand has also gotten smart. It has been moved though. So in Universal Analytics, you had a separate report for this. In GA4, remember everything is considered an event. So you can see your view search results event in the reporting interface. And if you go to your events report, use the search function, view search results, you can click on this blue link down here, and that will take you through to an overview card. Now, an overview card is going to show you here. You can see in the top 
corner, you've got view search result. So this is an overview of just one event and it'll give you an event count, total users, event count per user, if there's a value applied, the thresholding. And it'll also give you a tally here of the parameters. So GA4 events are built in two ways. You have an event name. In this case, you've got view search results. That's your event name. And then you've got parameters that are attached to your event. Now the default one there was all data, but that's not particularly useful. If you want to view your search results, you want to see the search term actually being generated. So you can change the parameter and it'll give you the parameter value. So in this case, you've got YouTube, Emoji Classics, Gopher, Android, and then the number of times that's been searched for. This is handy, but it's not particularly useful if you want to see your search terms over a longer period. Remember this overview card is just giving you a snapshot and the last 30 minutes for this one parameter. It is giving you the event count per country, so you can see how many times view search results as an event is being triggered by country, by gender, per session, where it's happening, and the page location it's happening on. What you can do though, if you want to get a little bit more advanced with your reporting for view search results, if you go back to your events report, click on uh, filter in the search for view search results, click on the blue plus sign here. It'll bring up a secondary dimension option here and you'll be able to add search term. So you can see here, if I've used the search functionality, I've got search term, if I apply that, I now have an event name of view search results and then I have another column with search term there. And it's giving me the event count and the number of users who have searched for that search term and have triggered that event name. Now there is a warning. It's unknown whether it's a bug, a quirk, or an instance of Google not necessarily just liking uh, the way certain websites handle site search. But the search term column, if you have configured it, won't always present data to you. Now you can see those in the real-time reporting view, so you know the search terms are being triggered. But our best recommendation at the minute given how volatile it is and whether it works or not is. Of the debate, we've seen some clients where it works fine and we've seen some clients where it doesn't work even though the configuration is the same, is to use the explore reports. The explore reports allow you to configure events and to display search terms, apply the event count and the number of users. So you can get all of the data, you can see the data there, it's just in the reporting interface, it's not always going to appear. If it doesn't, go to the explore area, build the same reports out there and you should be able to see them. If you're not seeing them, it might mean that the event isn't correctly configured and you might want to check whether the configuration is correct. For information on the configuration, go back to the first session we looked at um, two weeks ago. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at the reports. There are two types of reports by default in Google Analytics 4. The first is an overview report. And that's made up of a series of cards. It's going to display information at a glance just to help you quickly see uh, various bits of information and help you get to more in depth reports. The second is a table report, and that's more similar to Universal Analytics. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take the tech reports as a basis and we're going to look at tech overview and tech details. We'll go back to those later on, but we're gonna take those two as a way to look at common UI elements. So you can better understand what you're seeing when you go into these reports. So this is your report UI on the overview report. And there's a lot of standard elements across all of these. And as I mentioned, an overview report is built on a series of cards. Some of them are dynamic. So the ones where you've got here using the last 30 minutes, they'll update as you go through. Others, like used by platform, won't. Again, here you're seeing the platform of web is 100%. If you don't have an app and you just got a website, you're only going to see web there as 100%. Let's take a look at some of those elements. So in the top left-hand corner is where you're going to find the name of the report you're currently viewing. It'll tell you whether it's an overview report or not, and it'll tell you the information it's looking at. It'll be in the same place on each page, regardless of whether you're looking at overview or detail reports. You do have a comparison toggle just above that. So just above your 
report name, you can see all users and add comparison. If you click on add comparison, a slider will come up on the right and it'll allow you the option to build comparison there. And basically you can choose here to add various dimensions or remove various dimensions for comparison purposes. You can add up to five, but in reality, it's probably close to four because all users is considered uh, one of the five you're comparing. Next to that, you have your date picker option. So if you're in the overview one, you'll be presented with your date options. So these cards will update based on that, with the exception of the last 30 minutes, which is more like your real time view. Date picker has been improved. It's easier to use, it's easier to navigate. You can easily apply compare, but you also have much more default options available straight from the off. And underneath your date picker, you have three options there as well. The first allows you to edit comparisons. This again, is one of the quirks you have with GA4 at the moment. You have two places to add or edit comparisons. So you have the option next to all users in the top left hand corner, and you have the top right hand corner where you can edit comparisons there as well. They both do the same thing. I wouldn't worry too much. It's just you can access the comparison features uh, from two locations. The next option is to share a report. So if you've got a tech overview report in this instance, you've changed the date range and you want someone to be able to see the data you're looking at, you can easily share a link for this report uh, directly from within the interface. You don't have to screen grab it, you can just share a link and they'll be able to view what you're looking at or what you've configured. And then the last one is Insights. So Insights is gonna use Google's artificial intelligence. Uh, it was gone pretty handy in Universal Analytics. It got far more upgraded in GA4 though. Um, and you can see here, you've got options for things like basic performance, demographics, user traffic, technology, or e-commerce insights. You can click on those and it'll give you a greater insight into what Google thinks may be interesting to you. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the overview cards and the overview reports. They'll vary depending on what you're looking at. If you're looking at acquisition overview, you'll obviously get acquisition metrics in that uh, overview we looked at there. We were looking at tech. A couple of things to remember here. The report title stays in the same place and it will be dynamic, which I'll show you in a moment. Comparisons are easily easy to toggle on and off and they'll apply to all cards if possible. You can add up to four, although it says five, it includes the primary dimensions, so all users is considered one of those primary metrics that you can't change, we can change it, but it's always going to be your base one, so you can only apply four others on top of that. Date picker is easier to use, sharing a report is much easier, and insights will give you additional context on key elements about your data performance as well. Now, when you get to the table report, this is probably going to be the most similar to the current reports you use the theme in Universal Analytics with a slight refresh. So in UA, you got presented with a single graph or a chart. In GA4, you're presented with two. So here we're looking at tech details in the browser. You can see here we've got two charts at the top and then the table sits underneath it. Now these are gonna be based on the primary dimension selected. And you can see here, many of the elements are the same. But because the primary dimension in the table is set to browser, it's updated the report name to show you that we're looking at the details report. So there's much more information available. It's going to be a table report. We're in the text section and it shows you the primary dimension being looked at. So browser. If you change the primary dimension, it'll change the name of the report for you. So it'll be tech details and you could change that to operating system. You could change that to device or you could change that to um, OS. You can also see up here that thresholding has been applied, if it has been. We covered that in, in the first one, but if you've got the lights of uh, Google signals uh, turned on, because you either want to see demographic data or you want to use your GA4 data for app personalization targeting, thresholding will be applied. And you also have the option to add a filter. So underneath your tech details browser, where you've got thresholding, you can see here you've got the option to add a filter. So in the overview reports, you can do comparisons, 
in your details reports or your table reports, you'll be able to add filters. Filters will allow you to add or remove various bits of data rather than just adding comparisons. I'll just show you that in a quick overview. So again, we've covered comparisons. You can add comparisons in two ways. You've either got the fill comparison or you've got the add comparison in the top left or top right. So you can see here that I'm comparing device categories, including mobile, and I'm comparing that against all users. And this updates the two charts that I've got underneath it. Filtering, on the other hand, will either add or remove data from the charts rather than just comparing it. So it works in a similar way, but as I said, it will remove or add data as you specify. So here I've chosen to build a filter based on country, and I just want to include country of United States. So what that's going to do is it's going to update the filter label underneath my browser uh, report name, so tech details browser, and then the filter changes to I've got a filter of include country United States, and that updates all my metrics in the charts and reports there. You can click directly on the filters and you can easily toggle it to include or exclude. Now, this is quite a handy one. We have uh, some clients who used to have multiple views and they had views per country. So if you used to have a view for UK data, where you applied a filter just to display UK traffic and user metrics based on people in the UK, this is how you could actually build out the reports for this. Uh, you can apply these uh, table reports or details reports with these filters. You can also save them. So you could save a country specific view, or you can just go into the reports, pop all the filters on or off, and then you'll be able to get the similar level to the views you used to see. Now, underneath your charts or graphs, you'll have the table report. Search bar is a lot more reactive. Um, it's pretty handy, actually. It'll start guess what you're typing as you go through. So here I've got device model uh, set as my primary dimension. And again, you can see that the report name has updated to tell me I'm looking at device model in my tech details report. And my primary dimension here is device model. So if I typed iPhone, you can see there it filters the table for me, just display iPhone there. The one thing to note, if the blue plus sign, and you're presented with a list of uh, various bits of options there. You've got custom, you've got demographics, general geography, page per screen, platform. You can also search, which is pretty handy. It's one of the cleaner bits of the interface compared to universal analytics, compared to what you used to have. And you can see there, so I've got my primary dimension of device model, secondary dimension of device category, that's not going to display that in the charts above, but it does allow you to build out table reports there. The other thing to note, a couple of small quality of life changes again in these table and details reports is the number of rows and the page toggles have now been moved up to the top of the tables. So before in Universal Analytics, these were always at the bottom of the tables and it was set to 10 rows you could see. But if you change that to 50 or 100, you had a lot of scrolling to go through to change that uh, rows per page or toggle through your page numbers there. One of the handy things in the Explore tabs is you can specify the number of rows to display without the need to scroll, but you are limited to 500 rows. So if you have more rows than that, you're not going to be able to view them quite so easily. Now, there is a very a uh, handy feature in all of these details reports. Uh, you won't be able to view it in the Google Merchandise Store demo account. So if you do go into the demo account and you want to play around with it, you won't see the option to customize the report. You'll need to do that in your own report. One warning I'll give you is if you do customize a report, don't overwrite the default one, save it as a new version. You always want a clean version of the report to go back to in case you end up removing either metrics or dimensions that are valuable to someone else, 
But if you save as a new version, you'll be able to go to it and you save your clean version for anyone else to use. So you'll need to go into your own one, but this is going to give you a great deal of control as to the various bits you'll be able to see. So you can customize which dimensions are available for your report. So here we're looking at tech details and you can see here that browser is specified device category, model, resolution, app version. If I didn't want people to be able to see these various dimensions in the report, they can be removed. So if you just have a website and you don't have an app view, you, you might want to remove app version from this reporting. It's not relevant to you. You wouldn't necessarily use it but you could remove it from the report options if you wanted to. You can also add more dimensions in here if you wished. And metrics, you can add 12 of these. And what these will do is it will populate the columns here. So currently there's, um, you can see here, we've got users, new users, engaged sessions, engagement rate, engaged sessions per user, engagement time, event count, conversions, and revenue. If you don't sell online and you're not tracking revenue, you could remove the revenue column from this report. It's not relevant. There's no point having it in there. You can just leave it as it is if it doesn't offend you, but having the option to customize these reports is quite, quite nice to have. You can apply filters to these uh, details and the reports. You can also specify the types of charts you want to display. So you can have a line chart, you can have scatter or bar chart and you can customize those. And you can also customize the cards that appear on the overview screen. So you can choose your dimensions. You can also choose which ones are available from the dropdown. You can also choose which metrics are available. So if some of those cards on the overview screen aren't relevant to you, change them up. Display the information that's relevant to you and your business. You can change the visualization. You can apply filters. So if you are if you did have an app, but you only have an app for iPhone, you wanted to make sure that you split a iPhone card and you had one for Android, you could do that pretty easily here. Very handy. It's very cool. The only thing I can really recommend is if you do customize, save it as a new version of the reports rather than overriding the default built-in one, you'll be able to get the default one back quite so easily. So that's the UI for tables as we've covered off. There are some similar elements to the overview reports, but you will have two charts or graphs at the top. The table will sit underneath it. And the table will be the most similar bit of the report that you're used to seeing in Universal Analytics. The main thing is the ability that you can filter the data in the table reports compared to the overview reports where you can only apply comparisons. Unlike comparisons, data won't add to the report, so it'll filter it, there isn't the name. Secondary dimensions are as easy to add as they were in Universal Analytics. Just look for the blue plus sign and you can toggle uh, to view the amount of data being displayed. And you can edit, save, or customize your hearth contents, just as I've said repeatedly already, save any changes to a new version of the, the report rather than replacing the default one. Okay, so that is the UI for both overview and table. What we're gonna do now is take a look at the reports that you have access to. So we won't cover all of the UI elements, we've covered those here. We're going to take a look now at the reports themselves and what they show you. So home is where you'll first land when you log into your Google Analytics for account. It's a car based overview report and it'll help you easily navigate elsewhere. It's also where we see various aspects of the UI navigation and features that are used everywhere else as well. So this is what home will look like. As I've said, it's a series of cards. Some of these will update in real time. Others, you can change the date range on them yourself as well. So if we look at the first card, you'll see that you've got options here for users, event counts, conversions, and new users. So you've got a number of options there. But one of the handy things is if those metrics are not valuable to you, you can change them. So you can let Google pick what's going to be most relevant based on how you're interacting with the GA4 interface. You can apply custom metrics, or you can choose from e-commerce, events, pages or screens, revenue, sessions, or user. Now, this is probably the first time you're coming across the reference to pages slash screen. Screen refers to if it's an app. Page it refers to whether it's web. 
So if you don't have an app, you're going to see references to screen that isn't relevant to you, but just look for the, the first part of that um, metric name where it refers to page, page title or page path, and it'll be corresponding to screen, screen title or screen path. You also have the option to change the date for these cards here as well. So it's set at the minute to the last seven days. You can change it to 28, 90, more presets or custom. And you'll also be told whether thresholding has been applied to your card and your accounts. This will be based on whether you've got Google signals turned on. I wouldn't worry too much if you do need demographic data or you're using your GA4 data to help with your ad targeting, you'll need Google signals. It's not going to remove necessarily a lot of uh, the reporting. It's just going to take some of the lower metrics out. There's no escaping it, though, if you want demographic data. And you also have more options to view more details about the metrics you're looking at. So wherever you see the blue text and the arrow, that's where you're going to be able to click on to go straight to a report. Next up, you can see that you have a running tally over the last 30 minutes. And at the minute, this is reporting on the number of users per minute, and it's filtered by country. But you can again change this. So if you want the audience, town, city, or the first user campaign, medium source, or source platform, and those are going to be reporting on which campaign, medium source, or source platform first drove that user to your site, you can see that there and that will display over the last 30 minutes. And there for many users you report them. And again, you can view a more detailed report there as well just by clicking on the blue link with the arrow. The section underneath that is for recently accessed, and this is going to display the most recent eight reports that have been accessed in your account. Um, there's just a blue arrow on the right hand side. You can toggle that left or right. It'll just show you how long ago a report was accessed or when it was most recently accessed. Maybe there's like a quick link guide. Uh, it's just designed to get you back to where you may want to go as quickly as possible. Section underneath that is called suggested for you. Um, it's an odd section uh, because this is based on what is popular across all Google Analytics for properties. So this is a series of cards that are popular in any GA4 account. It's an amalgamation worldwide. How valuable that is to you as a business, I'm not sure, um, but there is an element here that is quite useful to note. So if you see the dotted underline here underneath suggested for you, you can hover your mouse over that. And what this will do is it'll bring up more context about the metric or about what's being displayed underneath. So you can see here it's explaining Google suggest cards that are popular across all GA properties. Personally, this, this specific feature of the dotted underline giving you more context is useful. The suggested for you cards, though, are less useful. I don't think there's a great deal in a uh, great deal of benefit in understanding what other users across Google Analytics worldwide is finding information uh, valuable is going to be relevant to you. So I would skip that. But the next section is insights and recommendations, and this could be very useful for you. This is going to be based on your data. Uh, so what Google is going to do is it's going to use its AI to serve you insights and you can view more detail. You can also screen grab them directly and you can also hover over the titles, which will give you more context. So you've got your dotted underline there. You can see that here in the second card that if you see a um, circle with a blue outline and a hollow center, that's what Google will consider an anom anomaly based on the data that it's historically got your account. So this is quite a handy feature. UA didn't do a great job of showing anomalies. GA4 does. And as I've covered before, if you see a blue text with an arrow, you've got a way to get through to more reports with more detail there as well. You can also have the ability to share insights. So you've got your share option there. And you can also give insights a thumbs up or thumbs down. It's a bit like uh, gamification, but Google will use this data, whether you give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, to try and serve you more relevant insights based on what's good for you. So although it's a little bit gamey, I would consider using the thumbs up, thumbs down if you find something more useful than not. 
If you click on the insights, you'll get more information here. I'll also tell you how it's calculating the, um, the insight for you, which is quite handy. So that's a quick tour of home. Home is a place where you'll just get quick access to what Google thinks are useful metrics and reports. Some of the recommendations are based on broad use cases and may not be relevant. That's going to be the suggested view section, which is based on all analytics properties. I would use the insight section. Um, it'll help you spot anomalies. It'll also help you understand why Google thinks that insight's relevant to you, and you can choose to thumbs up or thumbs down it. Now, the other reports, we're going to go through those shortly. Uh, these are the reports you're probably going to use on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's a couple of things we would just want to cover off before we jump into them, and these are some of the newer metrics and how they're, they're relevant and how they're calculated. We did cover these in the last session, but I think it's important to cover these at the, the beginning before we go into all of these in more detail. So, Engaged sessions. You'll see reference to sessions and you'll see reference to engaged sessions in GA4. GA4 introduced engaged sessions and it's calculated based on three possibilities. An engaged session is calculated if a session lasts longer than 10 seconds, it has one or more conversion events, or a user has two or more page or screen views. So again, screen refers to app views, page refers to web views. You can't differentiate between them, just keep that in mind. Personally, I think engaged sessions are a better metric to be reporting on than sessions as a whole. It's much better to understand who is engaged with your site based on these three parameters here. And if you do get asked about what constitutes an engaged session compared to a non-engaged session, you've got these three very specific parameters, which are great. It's a great way of being able to communicate it easily. The purpose of engaged sessions though was also to help get rid of bounce rate, which leads nicely on to engagement rates. So engagement rate is a measure of how many of your sessions in the primary dimension were engaged. It's calculated by engaged sessions divided by sessions. As we've covered, engaged sessions is designed to be a better metric than the likes of bounce rate. Bounce rate was going to be a single page view with the user leaving. Engagement rate is going to be calculating your engaged sessions divided by your total sessions to see how engaged people were. So it's going to give you a percentage of your users that spent longer than 10 seconds on a page, had a conversion event, or viewed two or more pages or app views. You then have engaged sessions per user. So this is engaged sessions divided by the number of users. Pretty self explanatory. And then you also have engagement type. Engagement time is going to replace your average time on page and your average session duration. Now, a session duration could still count uh, even if you're not looking at the page. The session would still be running in the background. Engagement time is going to be calculated when your app or website was in the foreground of the user's browser or in their phone screen. So this is a much better metric because it's going to be measuring when people are actually focused on your site or when they're focused on, on the app. Significantly better, much better in metrics to be reporting on. The one thing you'll probably find is you're not going to be able to compare it to the likes of engagement time, uh, session duration, or average time on page from UA. And I would say that's important to consider with most of the metrics in GA4, because GA4 is event-based, wholly event-based. A lot of UA data is either session or user scope or hit scope based. I wouldn't try and compare them. Um, it's not going to help you. And if you try and compare the likes of sessions, sessions as they exist in GA4 compared to sessions as they exist in Universal Analytics, they're not going to be the same. And even if you've had uh, GA4 and Universal Analytics running in tandem, as we've done for our clients over the last six, seven months, you'll notice a discrepancy in the number being reported in sessions. GA4 is an entirely different data model. Uh, sessions are calculated based on session start as an event. So I wouldn't try and compare them, consider it a clean slate. You do have your UA data there. If you do try and compare them though, you just need to accept that the numbers are going to be different to a tolerance of about eight to 10%. Uh, if it's higher than that, there may be an issue with tracking, uh, but from what we've seen, 
eight to ten percent difference is going to be pretty normal. I would say that the way sessions are calculated in J4 is an improvement, but again, I wouldn't compare to UA. And the same also applies to bounce rate. So you'll notice in this report that there is no bounce rate being reported. Bounce rate of the metric didn't exist, uh, then it came back. It's not calculated in the same way as universal analytics. The whole point of engagement rate being introduced was that it was going to replace the redundant bounce rate metric. If you customize your reports, as we talked about earlier, you can add in a column for bounce rate, but bounce rate in GA4 is now just the inverse of engagement rate. So if you have a engagement rate of 80%, the bounce rate is just going to be 20%. I wouldn't bother introducing bounce rate. Consider promoting it as being a redundant metric and try and push the business to focus on something like engagement rate which is much more positive. It also has specific parameters that are much easier for people to understand because this is going to be the percentage of people who have an engaged session, which is 10 seconds or more, has a conversion event, one or more, or has two or more page views in their session. So we would recommend not using bounce rate. The other thing to note is default channel groupings have changed in GA4. Some have had their definitions and measurement adjusted, few have been removed, but the biggest change is the addition of some new default channel groupings. And that's the ones in yellow. So you can see here, you now have things like audio, cross network. Cross network is gonna be a uh, search and display. So if you have performance max uh, paid search campaigns running, it'll generally appear as cross network in your GA4 reports. You've also got things that are going to be very specific to apps, mobile push notifications. You also have organic shopping, Amazon, eBay, organic social, Facebook, Twitter, organic video, YouTube, TikTok, Vimeo. And then you've got your paid shopping, paid social, paid video. Same sort of platforms, but it's if you're running ads on those individual platforms themselves. And you also have SMS. The other thing you'll note is you may encounter in your default channel groupings in the reports unassigned. Uh, that's not listed here, but unassigned is similar to not set in universal analytics. And it's Google not knowing where to display the data or how to categorize it. You can investigate it and you can recategorize it in most cases, but not always. Uh, we'll see that as we go through the reports, even in the Google demo account, they have unassigned in their reporting. It's part and parcel of GA4. It will improve in time, but if you do see unassigned, don't panic. The other thing to note with the new default channel groupings is it works in a hierarchical order. So it will work consecutively through your default channel groupings and try and categorize them in a specific order. So it's first gonna look for direct. It's gonna look for them if the user needs to go to cross network, paid shopping, paid search, social, video, paid or other. You can click into those and you can toggle on what's included within those default channel groupings, but you can also change the order. So if organic is more important to you and you want to try and capture organic traffic, whether it's shopping, social, video or search before you do it into paid, you could do that. I'm not necessarily recommending you do do that. All I'm saying is you can change the order of these to try and change the categorization of them for your reporting if one channel uh, is more important to you than the other. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the reports themselves. And um, we're gonna start with lifecycle reports. Now there are four groupings for lifecycle reports and each of these contains reports within them. We're gonna take a look at them in turn. Some will be relevant to you, some won't. And you have acquisition reports. So this is gonna look at how you acquired users from their first interaction with your site how you acquired the most recent session. You have acquisition, uh, sorry, engagement, which has um, your events being captured. You also have monetization, which looks at your e-commerce performance. If you have e-commerce set up on your website and you sell online. And then you also have retention, which is the new home for reporting on new versus returning users. That one is a slightly quirky report, uh, but we'll come to that in a moment. So acquisition has three reports. The first is overview, and the second and third is user acquisition and traffic acquisition report. So 
typically in UA, when you're reporting on acquisition, would be reporting on things like sessions. In GA4, you're going to be reporting on how you acquired specific users or how you acquired the most recent session. Now, we've covered off some of these report basics for the acquisition overview. Remember, overview reports are card-based. Some of them are dynamic. Some of them are showing you data over specific date ranges. And some of them have additional context available, as well as being able to change some of these. So as I said, if you see the dotted underline, you can hover over any of these, and it will give you the context as to how what's being counted here and how it's being triggered. So new users are counted whenever you get first open or if you have a first visit. You can also change these just by hovering on them. So you can see first user default channel, first user source, medium, source, medium, platform or campaign. And you also have the option to view more detailed reports directly from these cards. So overview is a great place if you just want to jump in, get a quick snapshot, or you want to be able to go and see more detail based on one of these cards themselves. So we've covered off a lot of these overview elements already. For acquisition itself, you need to remember that it's car based. It's designed to give you a quick insight into your users and your new users, give you a real time view, uh, but you can change this go for the arrows. And it, if you want more context as the information being displayed, look for the dotted underline to give you a bit more context. Also look for the blue text and the arrows for quick links through to more detailed reports. Now, the table reports for user acquisition looks like this. And you can see here, as we covered above in the first section, we've got the name of the report. So we're looking at user acquisition. And this is based on the primary dimension of first user default channel group. And you can see that down here in the bottom of the table. And you see it reflected in the report cycle as well. So we've covered the rear structure of this report already. We're not going to go into too much detail about that. And you get two charts and a table underneath. This is designed to help you understand where your new users are coming from. You can add a secondary dimension very easily. So if I want to see page path and screen class, remember screen is going to be relating to app view, page is referring to website view. So don't really see much see references to screen class. Focus on the first bit where it refers to page. And this is going to present you with a series of new metrics um, for user acquisition. Again, you can hover over any of those if they've got a dotted underline and it'll give you more information about the uh, metric and how it's calculated. So understandably for user acquisition, we're looking at new users. So the number of new users to the site. New user acquisition will also report on engaged sessions. We've covered how that's calculated there. You then have engagement rates, which is the percentage of engaged sessions, the number of engaged sessions per user, average engagement time, and then you have event count conversions and revenue. Now, if you don't have conversion events or revenue for your site, you could customize this report to remove those columns there and they wouldn't be displayed. So for user acquisition, it's designed to show you the first default channel for that user. Uh, you could change it to source medium if you wanted, which is fine. You have two charts at the top, you can customize those. You'll have the table underneath, which is what you're used to seeing in UA. And you can add secondary dimensions very easily, and you can change the metrics if you customize the report. Now, the other report in acquisition is traffic acquisition. And this is going to focus on the first default channel group or the most recent session started by that user. So users can have multiple sessions, but this report is going to focus on the most recent session, and it's going to be session stats. So it's going to report on users, it's going to report on sessions, engaged sessions, average engagement time per session, gauge sessions per user, events per session, engagement rate, event counts, conversions, and total revenue. Although you get the sessions here, I would still possibly recommend considering focusing on engaged sessions as a better metric to be reporting back to your businesses. If you think about it, you want to report on how engaged people are with your sites compared to just the number who are landing there. It's fine to report on that number, but it's not a great KPI in itself, just the number of sessions started. An engaged session, however, much more interesting. There's a lot you can do with that. If you have specific default channel groupings that have 
significantly lower number of engaged sessions, there may be something there that you may want to look at. Maybe your marketing strategy needs to be adjusted to be serving them different content or trying to drive them to different areas of the site. We've covered the structure of this report already. You're used to seeing it by now. We've covered off the different areas. You've got your name, you've got your charts and your titles, and then you've got your different metrics there. Again, you can customize those. One of the things that's a little bit odd in these table reports is the event count. And you'll see that um, in most of these table reports, but given the fact that everything is an event in GA4, the amount of events being generated by individual channels for your reports, not necessarily useful information. You could easily replace that with something that's more valuable to your business. But again, if you see the dotted underline, hover over that and it'll give you information as to what's being calculated and how it's being calculated there as well. So for traffic acquisition, designed to show you the default channel for that session initiation. You could change it to source medium, you could change it to source, or you could change it to medium. You'll be used to seeing two charts at the top, but you could change those. You'll have your table underneath. You can apply a secondary dimension to the table, just click the blue sign. And you can also change the metrics being displayed to if you customize the report. So those are the three traffic reports they have access to. You have your traffic overview, you have your traffic user acquisition, and you have traffic acquisition itself. I would say if you are reporting on acquisition for your business, you need to consider splitting out into whether you're reporting on users or traffic. Um, we've recommended that both are quite valid. Um, it's important to understand how you're attracting users. Whilst I appreciate it's still important to understand how you're generating sessions, though I would still advise using engaged sessions as your core metric. Okay, next we're gonna look at engagement reports. So engagement has five reports. One of them is a dashboard card-based overview. The remaining four are events. One is conversions, one is pages and screens. Remember screens refers to apps. So if you just have a website, don't worry about seeing references to screens. And then you have landing page. Now, people are quite happy that landing page is back, but it is a odd report in the context of GA4. Uh, it has a combination of metrics which you don't see elsewhere within the interface. Still valuable to have though. Okay, so this is your engagement overview. Um, as we've set, covered off in the overview UI analysis and in the acquisition overview, it's a series of cards and it's designed to send you to other areas of the site. You still have the ability to hover over um, dotted underlines to get more context. And this is going to help you understand how engaged people are on your site generally. One of the odd works in GA4, and it's one of many, is you'll see here that as we've covered, your dotted underline will give you context about what's being reported. But in the card above it, you have a, a question icon. That does exactly the same job as the dotted underline. It's just a UI quirk that um, Google's introduced. It varies whether you get the question mark icon or whether you've got the dots on the line. They do the same thing. It's just a, a novelty within GA4 itself. But if you see either of those, just know that if you click on those or hover, you'll get more context about the metric being displayed and it will tell you how it's being calculated. So your engagement overview is gonna be car based. There's no point dwelling on some of the specific metrics in there because they'll be very specific to your business itself. But remember the overview reports are gonna be car based and they're designed to give you quick insights to how engaged your users are. It's also gonna help you get a real time view as to where your users are going, you know, what, they've, what they're engaging with. If you're unsure about the information being displayed, look for the dotted underline or the question mark icon and look for the blue text and the arrows for quick links through to more detailed reports. That report also gives you some of the newer engagement metrics and they're better than some of the older behavior metrics in UA. Okay, so we're now gonna take a look at your events report and it's a table view and it focuses on event counts, users and events per user. So given the fact that everything in Universal Analytics is now an event, uh, sorry, GA4 is an event, you're gonna see a long list of events here and this will be automatically collected events. It'll be recommended events 
but you can also build in your own custom events as well. So if you are tracking things like form completions and you change the name of the events to specific form completions, you would see those there providing you've customized them and you've built them in the interface. Everything is an event. Uh, so you can see here, you've got your event list by event name in your primary column, primary dimension column. You click on this because it's blue text and underlined, it's gonna take you through to a overview report. Now this is an overview report of that specific event. And you can see here that you've got an event count, you've got total users, event count per user. So it's the same metrics you're seeing on the table report, but this is just filtered to show you this just based on a single event. And you can see in the top where your report name is, this has now just changed to the event you've clicked on. In this case, it's showing view promotion. And if you just needed to get a quick snapshot for a PowerPoint you're building for internal purposes, and you just need to see the total number of events, total users for that event, you could click on the event, snip this out relatively easily, drop it into a PowerPoint and you've got the numbers there. Next to that, you've got the various parameters that are contained for that event. So every event has 25 parameters you can add to, add to it. You also get your event count by country, by gender if you've turned on Google Signals, and then you'll get the page title or the page location as to where that event was triggered there as well. This is quite handy um, if you just need to get a snapshot of a specific event. It's not going to give you a great deal of information if you need a report, particularly in these card based formats where you have to scroll through multiple pages in order to see all the details there. So to remember, in engagement in events, your engagement report is table based unless you click on one of the events contained within, in which case it will take you to that event overview. It's designed to show you an event count for all of the events you've configured within your GA4 account give you event counts per user, which is quite a good metric to have. So I've covered off already, if you click on the individual events, it'll send you to a dashboard or overview report on just that event. And your demographic data won't display unless you've configured Google Signals. Okay, the next one in the event reporting is conversions. And you'll notice here in the top left-hand corner that you've got a filter automatically applied to this report. And this is whether you've configured a conversion event. Now, if you can configure conversion events in the in space, all you need to do is you go to settings, conversions, and you will see a list of every event that's been toggled to be a conversion. If you toggle it there, it'll take about 24 hours to start populating, but then it will appear in your conversion event report under engagement. The reason I'm mentioning that is not every website and not every business is going to have a purchase event that's considered a conversion. You might have something you consider a conversion if it's a form completion, if it's navigating to a specific piece of content, or downloading a file like a PDF or PowerPoint, or if you've created a free tool for people in Excel. Measuring something like that as a conversion is going to be more valuable to you than necessarily just a revenue driven uh, purchase. So if you build a custom event, and you want to mark it as a conversion, you can do, and it will there then appear in your conversion report. Just remember, it will take about 24 hours to start doing. So if you're gonna configure conversion events, do it ahead of the 1st of July switchover, just so you're starting to collect data in there uh, from now. So as we've covered, your conversions report is table-based, and it's designed to show you the events you've marked as a conversion. You can click on those and it'll take you through to your dashboard view. Again, demographic data won't display unless you configure Google signals. Now, the next one you've got is pages and screens. Again, screens refers to apps. So if you don't have an app, you're just concerned with page title and it'll only display page titles because you only have a web data stream. And you can see here that for the pages and screens report, it's taken the primary dimension of page title and screen class but you can also change that primary dimension if you wanted to, and you can change it to page path and screen class. So in your universal analytics, the default metric for this would have always been page path. So you can see just the slash if it was the home page or the name of your landing page. You can change it if you wish back to page path, but if you keep it as page title, 
as a bit of an SEO bod, and I know we've, as an SEO team, particularly here at the agency, we harp on about the importance of page titles. If you have the same page title used multiple times across your site, across multiple pages, they're all going to be catenated together and collected into one page title. You don't really see the difference if you have a unique page at URLs there. So the importance of having unique page titles is more important here. Um, just something to consider if you are doing SEO and you do configure this and you're wondering why certain page titles look considerably higher for specific pages, you may have multiple instances of the same page title. A tool like um, SEM Rush or Scream with Frog will help you identify if you have more than one page title used across your site. Pages and screens, table based. Designed to show you the pages with the most views, users, and views per user. So we've covered it is set the page title by default, but you can change this to page path if you're more comfortable with that dimension. I'm more familiar with page path and it works quite well for me. I'm used to seeing it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't use page title. But if you do use page title, make sure that your page titles are unique and not used across multiple pages. OK, and then the last one we've got here is the landing page report. This is the quirky one. This is one where it was reintroduced because uh, users were creating this themselves in GA4 through custom reports. Google re-implemented it, and you can see at the top, we've got landing page and it's designed to show landing page. Can't change the primary uh, dimension down here, so it's only ever going to show you landing pages. But the use of metrics and the combinations here are unique to the landing page reports. So you've got sessions, users, new users, engagement time per session, conversions and revenue. This combination of metrics isn't used elsewhere. You also also only get one graph and one chart with this one. Slightly quirky, but if you want to understand where people are coming to your site, it's still valuable um, and it's going to be based on page path. You will also see that some of these pages will be set to not set. It's not coming through. It's a valuable report. I will not rely too heavily on this. Um, it's quirky by nature. Uh, and I think it's a, a quick release from Google because people were doing it themselves and they wanted to control what information was being displayed for this purpose. So as we covered, landing pages are table-based. It's new um, and it's Google's attempt to try and mitigate SEO marketers creating it themselves with combinations Google didn't necessarily want to have. It's handy, but it's not fully compatible. Uh, due to the data model. So if you're trying to compare your landing page reports in GA4 compared to your landing page reports in Universal Analytics, not going to be comparable. Next section is monetization. Now, this has four reports. One is dashboard and card base. The others are e-commerce purchases, in-app purchases, and publisher ads. Some of these aren't going to be relevant. Um, but they exist. There's no, no way of hiding them or removing them. They are just there. So as we covered off already, and um, there are some quirks within the interface, but your overview report is going to be card-based, card-based reports and designed to show you snapshots with total numbers and uh, screen grabbable uh, charts just to quickly drop in. But you also have the dotted underline work and the uh, question mark icon there to give you more information about the information being displayed. It's just a quick glimpse of revenue, purchase revenue, total purchases, purchase revenue data per user. And have a, have a, some of these are going to be relevant to you, some of them aren't. If you don't sell online, uh, these reports aren't going to populate. If you're not set up e-commerce, you won't see these in there. And there's a little point navigating to, to them. There is a, another report contained within this, which is another quirk within GA4. So you can see, uh, is it on this screen? Just underneath these set of cards here, there is one called item list. Now item list, there is a bit of convert, confusion about uh, as to the purpose of it. I imagine it's a beta report. You can't navigate to it normally. You have to go through the overview report. 
But what it's designed to show is item lists that have been created. But you could do this with the primary dimensions of item category levels one through five if you wanted to. But if you try and change the primary dimension, you're given two options, item list name or item list ID. It's an odd report. They're not very clear as to what it should be used for. And because you can only navigate to it from the overview reports, I'm not sure how valuable it is or whether it's a report that still needs further documentation being released. So I would, again, choose to ignore even if you do have e-commerce turned on for your site. So in summary, the monetization overview is car based. Car based views give you quick snapshots, give you quick insights into your revenue and purchases. If you're unsure as to the information being displayed, look for the dotted line to give you more context, but also look for the question mark icon. Use the blue text scenarios for quick links through to more detailed reports. And that item list report is the only report you can only access through the overview report. You can't access it through the main UI space. Now, if we look at the e-commerce purchases report, it's a table report for your e-commerce purchases, as the name would suggest. This is going to give you a summary of your item names, items viewed, items added to cart, items purchased, and your item revenue. But you can change this if you wanted. So as we covered there before, the item list and item list ID ones, uh, reports that you can only access from overview is a little bit redundant considering you can go into your e-commerce purchases and you can view item name or you can view your item categories. So if you have products uh, nested under five levels of categories, it's quite excessive, but you may have that. You could then filter by category and see how many items were viewed within that category, how many were added to cart on that category, how many were purchased and the revenue generated by that category. It's, it's a pretty good feature. Um, it takes a little, little bit of configuration, so you may need a developer to help you do that. And if you're capturing the item brand uh, through Tag Manager, you'd be able to report on that as well. You can also add a secondary dimension there relatively easily. You can do that in any of the table reports, just look for the blue plus sign. And as we've covered there, the monetization e-commerce report table base, show you the number of items viewed, added the basket, sold and the revenue. Primary dimension is helped you to see the item name, but you can change that to item category one through five if you've got that set up. I would say that e-commerce reporting is rather more limited in GA4 compared to UA. It doesn't feel like it's fully come out of beta yet. And I would imagine over the next six months, given the extension 360 customers have, you'll see the e-commerce reporting enhanced over that time. There's no enhanced e-commerce here either. Now, monetization in app and publisher are going to be limited to specific app usage. You won't see any data in those if you don't have an app data stream. You can ignore those, which is quite a relief, although it will be nice to hide them. So I won't dwell on those. If you don't have app data streams, don't worry about those. And then the last report there is retention. Now, retention is another odd report because it's only got a single report in and it's dashboard view. There's no table view here. And all it's going to design to do is present you with a series of cards, um, but with no way to go through to further reports to see them. You'll be able to see a definitional description of the reports and how things are being calculated. And you'll get the pure number of number of users, new users versus returning users based on the date range you've selected. But you're not going to get a, a table report here. You will get as a cohort uh, based on user retention and lifetime value. But the cohort is only going to be a collection of users grouped based on the same criteria. And in this case, cohort is going to be on the day the user was acquired. So think back to the acquisition reports where you're reporting on user acquisition. That's going to be what drives the cohort in the report. It's a pretty light report, to be honest. I think the key thing you're probably going to take away from your retention report is the number of new users or returning users more than anything else. But if you want to understand more about the user retention by cohort, you hover there, it'll tell you how it's calculated. Now, demographics is a interesting one. Um, it's got two reports in. One is dashboard, the other is table. 
these reports will be pretty empty unless you turn on Google signals. So you will get some basic information in there, but not user specific. Um, we can't make that call for you. Uh, it depends whether you want to see demographic data for your users, or if you're planning on using your GA4 data to help you with your ads targeting. If you are, you need to make sure that your privacy policy accurately communicates and tells users how you will be using that data across various Google products. There is some help on Google support pages. Uh, they won't tell you exactly what you need to cover, but you do have to agree and click a tick box in GA4 that you have met Google's guidelines for processing data. If you do turn on Google Signals though, your demographics overview report will look like this, series of cards, but it will populate with users based on their gender, interests, age, language, country, and it'll give you the users in the last 30 minutes there as well. You can view more detailed reports. Again, look for the blue uh, text and the arrow and they'll take you through to table reports as well. Now, this is one of the things you'll see with the tech report as well as with the demographic report. There's only a single uh, table report for demographic and you can see here we're in demographic details and it's pulled out the primary dimension of country. In UA, you'll be used to seeing audience data and having individual reports, whether you have overview, age, gender, interests, geo, behavior. You won't get that in GA4. Instead, you have a single details report for demographics, and then you choose the primary dimension that's valuable to you. So you still have access to all the reports you had in Universal Analytics. It's just rather than having multiple report links, you just change the primary dimension. So you can choose country, region, town, language, age, gender, or interests. You will notice here that if we've gone to gender, there will be a section called unknown. Now that is if people are not signed into their Google accounts and have turned on uh, ad personalization. If people have signed in and they've turned off ad personalization, you're not gonna be able to track whether they're male or female, uh, regardless of whether you've turned on Google signals or not. So what you may want to do if you plug this data into Look Studio, for instance, is apply a filter to remove unknown. It's just, there is no way around it. If people choose not to share their data with you, it will not display in GA4 and it will display as unknown. It's demographics in summary, two reports, one dashboard, one table. It'll be a quick overview of demographic information if you turn on Google signals. In most cases, a view will populate like country. It'll also give you a real time view as to where your users are by country. Again, if you're unsure about the information being displayed, look at the dotted line. And the table reports, although it looks like you only have one compared to the half a dozen you had in Universal Analytics, all you need to do is go to the table reports and change the primary dimension. That will give you access to all of the reports you used to see just in one uh, interface rather than clicking through multiple reports. Now tech, we covered off a lot of tech in the UI elements, so it won't dwell too much on these but it contains two reports, one dashboard and one tech table report. And it's very similar to demographics in that it'll give you a little snapshot as to what people are doing. And again, in the table report, you'll see there that the name of this report is tech details and it's set to browser because that's the primary dimension set. But again, if you're in universal analytics, what you'll have seen is you would have had a report for browser, you would have had a report for network, mobile, or device type. In J4, all you need to do is go to your tech details report, click on the primary dimension dropdown, and you're presented with all the different types of primary dimensions available for you in your tech window there, from browser, device category, model, screen resolution, app version. And if you want to change this list, all you need to do is customize the reports, save it as a new version, and then people will be able to access from the list that you specify itself. So tech, in summary, two reports, one dashboard, one table, give you quick insights into user's tech information, also give you a real-time view of where your users are by platform, only really gonna be relevant if you have apps and websites or you have a single data stream. Uh, you won't see any other information in there. And it replaces a lot of the pre-built reports you had from UA. They're still there, just you have a single reporting interface 
and you need to change the primary dimension to see those there. You can save it. So if you wanted to create one that looked at browsers and save that as a browser report, you could save that into your own uh, custom list report. If you wanted to see by device type, you could also do that and save that. You will notice in device category uh, for GA4, there is also a new category there called smart TVs. So as people watch more ads on smart TVs, if you're using uh, apps on your smart TV, like YouTube, that will be counted in there as well. OK, so that's generally most of the events. There's a couple of things I just want to cover off before we finish. Um, where you configure your events, where you set them up and how they're counting has moved. Uh, it used to be under a configure section. Uh, the configure section was removed. So if you have looked at GA4 in, in the early part of this year, you would have seen a configure section. It's now moved with under the settings. So if you go into settings and then go to events, you will see that you have the option here of all of the events you're tracking. Some of these will include the default ones. Some of them will include the recommended or enhanced ones. They also include your um, custom events that you set up and you can toggle on specific events to be conversions. What's a conversion for you is going to be very specific. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be monetary or transaction based. Think about what is actually going to be a valuable business KPI for you and mark that as a conversion. And then you'll have a specific conversion report you can go into as well. And that'll take you through to your conversion reports. So if you toggle on an event here, that's conversion. Just underneath that, go into conversions and you'll start seeing it populate in there within the uh, about 24 hours. So if you don't see anything straight away, don't panic. Uh, but if you remember back to the first session where we talked about creating custom events for GA4, um, you can put it through debug view in Tag Manager and test that it's actually firing into your GA4 account before you set it live. Give it 24 hours and then you'll see it report in your uh, reporting, whether that's your dashboard view or your table view. If you do create a custom event in Tag Manager, just make sure you create it with the exact same name in your events so that it knows to pull it through correctly as well. And that is the reporting for GA4. So we haven't gone through each report in significant detail because the metrics are customizable, but we have looked at the common UI elements, how to navigate what each report contains and the various um, ways of navigating around it and things to note, as well as some of the, the quirks contained within. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, please take a, a, a drink of water. Um, Talking for an hour and a half is uh, no easy, no easy feat. So, so well done. Um, we do have some questions um, from some of the delegates. Um, so I'll just work my way through them if it's okay, Chris. Um, yeah. We have one from Joe. Hi, Joe. Um, does current GA take 70, 72 hours to process events or is this just, just GA4? So UAE can take up to four hours to process events. Uh, for us to process, GA4 can take up to 72, but typically it's 24 hours. There is no data processing limit as such in GA4, other than the fact that it does it sequentially, because everything is an event in GA4. Google prioritizes the processing of events based on that. It's why if you go into the reports with tables, you'll never see data for today. It means Google won't have processed the data as of yet. And if you build a custom event, you'll only see it if you do it in debug view. You want to see it before putting it live. Well, I hope that answers your question, Joe. Obviously, if you need anything further, please don't hesitate to uh, email me and I'll uh, send over that query to Chris. Um, second question, will UA account automatically move over to GA4 on the 1st of July if we don't manually migrate setup? My team have admin access issues currently and I'm unable to commence manual setup. So, yes, but it's not necessarily advisable as the account access will carry over as well. And Google will try and auto migrate uh, the events and conversion events you have set up. 
Some of that is okay. Uh, there are some legacy events we've seen on clients where it's been smarter to migrate those across uh, rather than build out from scratch. I would probably recommend actually building a brand new J4 account and getting the data populated natively through Tag Manager. If you have Tag Manager access, it's relatively easy to get that spun up very quickly. Um, so I will just finish typing on that one. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Um, and a question from our good friend, uh, Bernard Page. Um, well, three questions in actual fact. Um, is there a better way than just copying and pasting into PowerPoint? Um, how are people reporting out results? Okay, so that question is a good one. Um, and you may have seen in Google's interface that uh, the reporting in GA4 is rather limited from a view perspective. The cards are great for the little snippets, but I know from our clients and from how we report as well, little snippets don't exactly build out a, a dashboard. So we use Looker Studio. Um, Google wants you to use GA4 to store your data process the data. They don't want you to use GA4 for actually doing the reporting and dashboards. They want you to send that data into the likes of Look Studio. Benefits of Look Studio is it can process more than just Google Analytics data. It can process Google Ads, it can process the SEM Rush or other connectors as well. Um, so if you want to do dashboards and reporting, I would take the data from GA4 and plug it into Look Studio. We do a lot of Look Studio builds, customizations, dashboards, setup and goes. Uh, so if you want to pick that up with us, send me a message. We can look at that for you. Thank you, Chris. Um, second question, can you add in costs, somehow calculate some form of um, ROI for e-commerce? Um, that one I will double check and come back on, but I don't think it's possible within the GA4 interface. However, uh, again, if you use the likes of Look Studio, uh, you can do custom calculations within Look Studio itself. So, although I'm saying Look Studio is a great uh, dashboard reporting tool, um, you can automate sending of PDFs out to various members of the business. You can access it online, you can change the data range, it's fantastic. J4 connected to Look Studio hasn't been fully updated yet. So some of the metrics and dimensions haven't carried across. So things like average engagement time. It's a great metric in J4, but you can't get to it natively in Look Studio. You can calculate it, which is fine. You'd be able to calculate an ROI for e-commerce in Look Studio, even if it doesn't exist in J4. Yes, Chris. And finally, um, time on site as a measurement of engagement. Can you split conversions, non-conversions to try and uncover causes? You could create a custom audience, so people who convert versus people who don't, and then you'd be able to apply the engagement metrics to those audiences. Um, what I probably do is actually build a Looker Studio report and have two rows, one being your audience of converters, one being your audience of non-converters and then pull out the engagement rates for each of those and report on them as a uh, scorecard. Thank you, Chris. I hope that answers your question, Bernard. Um, OK, so I think that brings us to the end of today's session, unless there are any further questions. Um, as I mentioned, um, I will be sending over a link to today's recording um, as well as the slide deck. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, cons um, to contact either Chris or I, and we'll do our best to come back. Um, as Chris mentioned, there is potentially a third session, which will be a paid for session. So if you do have any interest in that or will require any further information, please, again, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, but without further ado, I would just like to thank Chris again for his time um, and thank you all for attending. Cheers. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.